I'm really going to change gears. First, I, I'm not talking about hearing um, at all. I'm talking about really, um, I would say, fundamental questions in cell biology and really pushing on soft stuff. And all of these ideas about elasticity, plasticity, hardness, it's hard to even imagine how to apply it here. Um, and first of all, my, my, my background is, is, um, is in mechanical engineering. That's my undergraduate. Um, I'll give some of the preliminary stuff. I'm trained as a mechanical engineer. I have a PhD in aeronautics from Stanford. And um, I worked on hearing a long time. And the last few years, I work with Claire Waterman, who is a cell biologist. And um, this work that I'm going to be talking about uh, involved Daphne Manasaki, who was uh, recruited by us to do the AFM work on, uh, on cells. And William Shin is, there, is Claire's uh, microscopy person because we need microscopes to, if you're going to work on cells. And you have to get the AFM to work with a microscope, which is, you know, there are some co commercial AFMs do that, but to really get a good microscope takes some work, um, like if you want to hook it up to a confocal one. So my, my I guess I, if I'm going to say if you really want to work with cells, work with biologists, and also have a good question. I have to say, when we started this, we didn't have a good question. And both of these, bo both my lectures today are, are in the process of getting published, and I'm getting better at formulating the question. But really, the question shouldn't be, what is the Young's modulus? Because it's changing. And that is in the biological question. So that's why it's important to get um, a good question. So, so let me, this is with the motivating uh, thing about cells. They were interested in how they move. And the reason that they move, uh, it's uh, both a normal physiological thing and also uh, an abnormal thing. They move during development. It's, it's necessary that they move. They, they move during wound healing. That's, that's necessary they move. They move during cancer metastases. Uh, that's not a good thing. Um, but how they move is, is still, it's not understood very well. And there's basically two different mechanisms and probably more on how cells move. The, the, the basic one shown on the left is, um, is really the subject of this talk. It's when, if you put a cell on a substrate, they get very flat, and the cell moves from left to right according to the steps shown there. There's actin is a, is a polymer in the cell, and it polymerizes, and when it does, it's supposed to push the cell forward, and at the same time, there are adhesion molecules that bind it to the substrate or unbind it. And then there's myosin molecules that are pulling up the, the rear. And, and it's sort of pushing and then grabbing and then pulling itself forward and inching forward like that. That's the common view. Another view is more, maybe more applicable to cells and tissue uh, where, um, like a cancer cell. They don't move that way at all. They don't use adhesions. They use pressure, and they bleb. And uh, that's, that's a subject of, a, of another project that I'll, my other lecture. But the question is, does the, even the first one involve measure, uh, any kind of cytoplasmic pressure? And one of the problems about the actin polymerization is that it has to detach from the front of the membrane in order for monomers to get on there and polymerize, and then it has to get back and push. 
And there's a whole theory called the Brownian ratchet, which is devised to explain how that works. Um, so I think my question now, after working on this for two years, uh, is, um, you know, what's doing the pushing? Is it cytoplasmic pressure really doing, and I'll, I'll get more into that, or is it due to actin polymerization? And I, I think the answer is it's both. But uh, So this just shows the microscope um, that, that it's a standard bio, this is an, actually an ancient thing. This thing I put in a cell biology lab uh, and we have a confocal attachment at the bottom there so that we can visualize um, the cells. Um, I won't talk much more about that. This is standard Brooker bioscope. So this shows some of the images um, um, that Daphne obtained. Uh, these are images of, of um, rat, kangaroo rat kidney cells. They were chosen because they're very flat, and you can visualize the different structures. You can see the actin in light blue that's stained with uh, F, F tractin, and you can see uh, the adhesions stained in pink um, using M apple paxillin. These are all these molecules and, and, uh, and markers are something you have to get used to. But basically, what Daphne did was she just poked around on different structures. That's not a good thing to do if you want to get a paper published. Because, well, well, well what we found out is that it depends where you're pushing and, and what phase of the cycle. These, you know, uh, sometimes it's advancing, sometimes it's retracting, and uh, it depends where you're pushing. So there's a lot of time dependence. There's a lot of heterogeneity, um, and it's hard enough to do AFM period to get the contact point, to get the right contact mechanics, to get the cell height, to correct for the bottom, because these are very uh, thin things. When you indent a thin, soft thing, you don't want to feel the bottom. And we published some work on how you correct for that, both uh, Hertz and Snedden. Um, so we're here we were using a pyramidal tip, which so we pretended that that was a cone, and we corrected for the bottom. And um, so we could get things in, you know, the kilopascal range, and we're also measuring different cell heights. Um, but the problem was we got a force indentation curve that nobody ever really talked about. And we show the fit in red on the right, but there's a bump there. And we don't see the bump every time, but we see the bump a lot. And it depends if uh, what phase of the cycle of moving that you're in and where you're pushing. But from those two parameters on there, delta and D, um, we figured out that we tried to get the meaning of that. So, so this became the question, what, what does this, this force distance curve tell us? And uh, what it's telling us, we think, is we can get the tension in the membrane. So, so actually, this is kind of a model of a, of a lamellopod, and this model is based on some, something published in, I think, in Nature Methods just a few years ago using a very fancy super resolution dual objective method. It came out from uh, a lab in Harvard. They found that there's two, two layers, uh, an upper and a lower layer of actin cortex. I'm gonna talk about cortex a lot now. And it's, that's the thing that's both polymerizing and it also has, I'll show you a model of the cortex on the next slide. So that the, the the plane is, a, is, is the bilayer, 
And under the bilayer, there's this dendritic network of actin with myosin motors inside of it. And so it's like pulling and creating a tension. And we thought that that bump is telling us something about the tension that's created in that cortex. So it's like, for an engineer, I guess you would call it a pretension or pre-stress, or it's like pre-stress concrete, only it's constantly changing, uh, depending on, and also cells don't like to be touched. So it's, when, when you touch it, it like disassembles or tries to move, and so it's, all of these things need to be considered. So I'm gonna tell you how we, how the, we got the tension out of that bump in the AFM curve. So first of all, it's a new AFM problem, a new contact problem. People always worked with a, a half space, right? The Hertz or Smedin. So this is not a half space, it's a layer. And it's a layer that has, has a pretension in it. And it turns out that it also has an elasticity that and it has bending modulus. That I'm gonna be talking about a lot of that in my next talk. But the first thing is how do you get the tension? So, and it's not, so under the, the curve, here we're assuming a parabolic, in, you know, uh, radius on, on, on the, it's model the sharp tip um, of a pyramid. I mean, it's a crude model, okay? But using, uh, this, is by, this is basically what Hertz did f for a half space. But it's not a half space because there's nothing underneath it in this model, and, and there's tension in it. So what, so th this is, the equations that I solved, I actually had to change the equations in the middle of a review because they were criticizing that I didn't have bending. So, the, the, the equation I'm solving is a plate with pre-stress in tension. So it has D is the bending modulus and gamma is the tension. And actually I thought I made that equation up, but I, of course no, one never makes up his own equation. And this is, has a name, it's called the Fafel von Karman equation uh, from civil engineering and structural they're, they were interested in designing bridges with this equation. <clears throat> but basically, the second equation is the standard Hertz integral equation. Uh, but in this case, it's instead, the, the kernel is not the one over R thing, it's a log thing, which complicates. That's what makes it different. So you have to solve, you have to find the pressure and solve it when there's a log kernel. So the way I, I did it is I differentiated it to get it to look like a Hertz problem. And then it looks like I differentiate with respect to the radius. And um, the object here is to get the contact pressure under the indenter. And of course, you, with, with all of these contact problems, you don't know the radius of contact radius, and that's part of the solution. So it turns out that it looks like the superposition of two, two, um, two problems that have appeared in the literature, so I didn't have to work too hard to solve it. And uh, so an elastic membrane indented by a parabola turns out it's the sum of two half space problems, the, co the sned and cone problem, and then a flat indenter. And um, so the pressure distribution is known for both of those. So because uh, these are, so I didn't really have to solve anything, I just had to make an analogy between elastic modulus and um, the tension that appears in, in, in the equation. So actually I could get an expression for the tension 
it's called gamma here, in terms of the cantilever spring constant and these two parameters, delta star and d star, which I got off the AFM curve. By the way, uh, just a typical values of uh, d star are five nanometers. You wouldn't like that. But that's what it is. I mean, and, and you know, there are proteins that stick up uh, that are bigger than that. So, I mean, you know, I'm hoping that I don't, you know, I really don't know, really don't understand the bump yet. But the fact is, is that we can get tensions that have been measured by other methods. So, um, and these, it shows uh, here in the hundreds of piconewton per micron uh, um, r regime. And you can measure tension using, uh, by pulling tethers on cells or doing micropipette aspiration. But this is much gentler and we're getting similar results. One of the things that we had to do, please uh, warn me when I'm running overtime because I'm not paying. Huh? Okay, yeah. So in the middle of the review, I, uh, the re uh, reviewer said I'm not considering bending. And so I, I had to do that. But that's why I went to that other equation. But you can see what, so the first, this shows the actual deformation of this parabolic probe. And the arrow shows where it leaves, where the, the cell membrane leaves the probe. Uh, so the first part of the curve is the parabola. And we know that. But the second part is, turns out it's a Bessel function that has to go back up to zero at the right hand side and it has to match the slope and the uh, displacement at the contact point which is at the contact radius which is part of the solution. Um, that was also why I, I don't know how you can always specify the contact area. I mean, it's, if it's elastic, it's part of the solution. So I guess maybe we can talk about that later. But in any case, what you get is an eigenvalue problem. And it depends on the value of this parameter, um, which is um, kappa, which is the ratio of the tension to the bending modulus, kappa squared. So if you know the tension, and you know this value of 1.5, um, you can actually get the bending modulus of the membrane. And then once you know the bending modulus, just using a simple bending theory, uh, I guess Euler beam theory or Euler Bernoulli theory, whatever gives the relation between elastic modulus and bending modulus, you can um, also get the elastic modulus and the thickness of the cortex. So we can get, actually get all of those things. Um, and that's a lot of information that you, to get just from an AFM curve. So we're finding, we're finding that the, the bending modulus is way larger than what people thought because it has this cortex, and it's larger than just the bilayer. And it's also the Young's modulus is way larger than what, if you're used to cell indentations, there are few kilopascal. Here we're talking tens or even 100 kilopascal. So it's like a very, um, it's like a shell. And it's very, it, it's, it may be soft and squishy on the inside, but this, it's quite stiff, or it's way stiffer than people thought as it's assembling and disassembling. And all of this is changing on the time scale of minutes. 
I mean, a cell can crawl like, um, you know, I mean, some very fast ones can go a micron in a minute. So, um, you know, that's another issue. If you're doing AFM, you know, you can't take too long to do it because it's, it, the cell's gonna move. Um, we can also estimate the cytoplasmic pressure from using a force balance at the, at the thin end. And we use basically uh, Laplace's law. Uh, another reviewer's, I'm giving you all my reviewer's comments and I'm hoping that I will satisfy the reviewer with this. But he, the reviewer is saying if the, I was getting several kilopascals for cytoplasmic pressure and the reviewer said, I'm overestimating it, it's way too high. And really that the edge is going to open up and the curvature will be um, much smaller or the height will be bigger and I, I will be overestimating the pressure. So using that tension plate equation, the first curve is like a taper, the natural taper. I did, in the model, I didn't, or in a, in a lamellipod. And with the, so if there is a pressure there, it will inflate the lamellipod into the other uh, shape and we're able to actually measure, to get the cytoplasmic pressure. So we can, with AFM, we can also get the pressure in the cell. Um, this shows the basic uh, idea behind how you get the pressure. You <clears throat> you, there's a balance between cytoplasmic pressure pushing and uh, the tension pulling on the periphery. And this was another point that uh, the reviewer said, I'm missing the polymerization force. And so I, I had a way of putting that in, I won't go in that, but it turns out that the polymer is the effective pressure due to polymerization and the effective pressure due to um, the cytosolic pressure due to, we think myosin motors in the cortex, uh, they're, they're comparable. So we think that actually <coughs> this pressure helps uh, the polymerization process because it pushes the membrane out of the way so that monomers can intercalate, intercalate, I guess is the word, get in there at the end and uh, do their job. So this shows kind of the estimates of pressure. And um, we're now thinking that the cytoplasmic pressure due to some kind of molecular interaction in the cortex is comparable to the polymerization force. So I think I'm coming to an end here. And so we're able to, to get cell membrane cortex mechanical properties using the FM. And we're able to measure the tension, bending rigidity, the thickness. And I, I, in my next talk, I'll show how uh, we actually measured the thickness using a confocal scope and um, I'll tell you how we did that, but we didn't measure it here. These are just inferred. Um, and we get the elastic modulus. And all because I didn't ignore the bump in the curve. So don't ignore the bumps <laughs> if you think they're real. <laughs> um, and so we're also able to get the cytoplasmic pressure. And the, the model that we have is that this pressure is pushing the membrane forward and actually compresses the network back because it's being held by adhesions. And that creates room for actin polymers to get in there without re needing the Brownian ratchet. Uh, you don't need it as much, or it, let's say it helps the Brownian ratchet. And that was another thing. I say you don't need it. They didn't like that. So I'm saying they're helping it. Uh, so, yes, so we're, 
The gap created by the pressure allows actin polymerization to facilitate this Brownian ratchet. So if you want to ask any questions at this time, I'd be happy. Yes. Um, if there's, is the um, thing you're doing your AFM on, is it stuck? Lamellapod. Right, thank you. Is the <laughs> lamellapod stuck straight to the substrate, or is it, it up a little bit? It's up a little bit because uh, there, are, there are adhesion molecules that grab on, and it's, it's not flat, okay? So the, where, the place that it touches is really the adhesion molecules. And that's maybe a few nanometers? Yeah, involved? yeah. So does that place uh, an upper limit on how much bending you can do before it starts hitting the substrate, and does that cause a problem? Well, um, we're bending the upper one. Oh, right, because it's up uh, yeah. in the middle. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you were talking about five-two uh, nanometers. Yeah. Uh, and you always have problems in finding the contact points. Really big contact problems, points. yeah. Five to ten nanometers is so small, and it's like small. Very yeah, big. so we, we do a lot of... Um, How do you find the contact points? Yeah, by, well, we find the contact point by fitting to, uh, in, uh, go back, if I can go back, I can, uh, the, go back to where we fit the curve. It's in the beginning. Uh, no, okay. There. I don't know if you can, you see the little circle there? That's, fi that's finding the contact point, assuming the bump isn't there. So we, we find the contact point by fitting the other part of the curve. The red, you see, if, you, if the red, you know, we do this, we correct for the bottom using the, a formula I, do, I published for the co uh, correcting the cone. And so it's part of the fit. It's part of the fit. I think in the 